will be the man standing next to me, David Lay. Probably a lot of you already know. One of the most well-known Chinese Americans in California. I kid you not. I've known this guy for a long time. He's got a lot of things uh, going on. He lectures on Chinese American history throughout the Bay Area. Uh, he's an extraordinary person. I'm glad to no, know he's my friend. I'm glad that he agreed to speak here today. One thing I didn't know until he sent me his bio was that he was a commencement speaker at the UC Berkeley's class of 2019. That is incredible. I'm lucky they let me commence, <laughs> much less be a speaker. That, that's great, David. Anyway, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you, Brian, and thank you for setting this up. It's so heartwarming to see so many people come from all over for this kind of uh, annual migration back to uh, Chinatown that was so active here so many years ago. My talk today is everything you wanted to know about the Tongs but were afraid to ask. So think of some questions you might have about the Tongs. Now, for those who are not familiar with the Tongs, They've been uh, branded as the Mafia, the Underground, uh, or, and then the Tong Wars, especially in the late, late 19th century, early 20th century. We don't hear much about them now. But actually for the Chinese, uh, a meeting place is a Tong, so all of us here today forms a Tong. And it depends on what you want to do with it. And because of the, some of the Tongs did some illegal things, that's the branding of all the Tongs. So today I'm just going to give a little history, but if you have hit, uh, questions, I'll try to answer them. I might not have the answer. So first, this is in Weaverville. Anyone from Weaverville? Anyone been to this temple in Weaverville? Yeah, quite a few. Their famous thing is in 1854, there was a Tong War between the Hong Kong boys and the China boys. And so this, you know, several people were killed. Both sides hired mercenaries. They hired white people to help them drill. <laughs> and uh, they bought weapons. And they paid the uh, blacksmith there weeks before the fight, a lot of money to make these spears, pitchfork, so you can see them fighting each other. It's still a big thing in Waverville, and they have a, a plaque to show where they had this fight, and they have more, well, you see spectators on the back. Sorry, I couldn't get it on this. I don't have the adapter. But on the back, they have spectators. Actually, there were more spectators than fighters. <laughs> And it was a huge thing. And then also, this is a plaque in Tuolumne, China camp. They also have a Tong War. And this is uh, in honor of Mark Twain, because he was there also. But if you read the plaque, it's, they talk about the Tong War, because this was seems to be so exciting that the Chinese would be killing each other. And again, <laughs> There were hundreds of the Chinese, one side against the other, and so they called the Tong Wars. But if you dig into these two Tong Wars in 1854, this is very early on, uh, five years after the Chinese started coming here, it was between the Yanwo District Association and the Samyup Association. Yanwo are the people, the guest people, called Hakka the Hakas, and then the Samyup were the people near Guangzhou. And this hatred between the two groups goes back hundreds of years. The locals came to Guangdong about 800 years ago, and the Hakka came just maybe 100, 200 years later. But because they came later, all the good land were already taken. So they were kind of driven out to the edges. They spoke different dialects, different habits. 
And so the Hakka were the minority. But the Qing government, the Manchu government, used the Hakka to fight against the uh, locals. And the Ch Chinese government always did that. They split up the different ethnic group, and when they want to do something, they would get one group to fight the other group. So there was no love between the two groups. But the Hakka, this was a Hakka and Samyak few. It's more dialect. They really can't communicate. So it's really nothing to do with mafia or anything. It goes back to the old country. And this even predates the Hakka Punti War in Guangdong province, which started about a year later and lasted until 1864. And they estimate about a million Chinese died in Guangdong. This is more damaging than the Taiping Rebellion for Guangdong, this fight. So this was more between different ethnic group, you can call that, and different dialect group. So David, in the Rebellion, did the war end? Was there some... It was just one day. <laughs> <laughs> of course the Samyap, because the Samyap <laughs> had money. They were the merchants. And the Hakka were always the minority. They always have few people. This is the Hakka uh, District Association. It's actually uh, five districts. They have five dialect groups. It's the only uh, district association we have in San Francisco that's not one language, but five and from different areas. But these were all the Hakka. It's very interesting about the Hakka. We haven't done enough study. But if we check on who did the mining, who came to mine, I would think it's the Hakka. They've been mining in Southeast Asia, tin miners. And they did the quarry in Hong Kong, Quarry Bay. Uh, San Francisco, our sidewalks in San Francisco got their granite from Quarry Bay. When uh, the earlier years, when we put in the sidewalks in San Francisco, the St. Mary's Church in Chinatown, the foundation came from China. So, and it was the Hakka that, that did all the mining. If I were a farmer in Guangdong, and you tell me gold was discovered five, 6,000 miles away, and I have to pay a whole year wage to go there, I'm not sure if I will go there because I don't know anything about mining but the Hakkas would. And the Hakkas were already in Hawaii, which is only a three weeks trip. They probably heard about the discovery of gold before they heard it in the East Coast. So we have to do more study about the Hakka. But this is their association in San Francisco today. And here's the Samyap Association. They're still here, they're, they're the wealthiest. I think their income's maybe 70,000 a week, I mean a month. So uh, when I was young, I thought all these associations would go away because they're all old men and they didn't do that much work, but they're still here today because they have this income from property and there's always volunteer to help you spend your money. So <laughs> these will always be here. They figure out long-term sustainability as long as you have earned income, property, you're going to be around a long time. So for, if you want to start an organization and want to make sure it continues, get property. <laughs> Young men get old too. And then later on we hear about Little Pete. He was the most famous gangster in San Francisco at the end of the 19th century. And when he died, it was the biggest funeral San Francisco ever experienced. So you can go into Google and check out Little Pete. And he fixed the horse races. He was Samyap, uh, a merchant. He had a shoe store and he owned a theater. And he liked to tell people he wrote the plays for the theater. <laughs> and he always wore armor uh, to protect himself from gunfire and other assassins. And he had a white police sergeant that was his bodyguard. Before uh, the movie, The Godfather, where they had a police captain to 
as a guard while well, he had a sergeant, but they got him and killed him in a barber shop on Waverly and Washington Street. This is Little Pete. People claim he was killed by Big Jim. <laughs> and you know a guy named uh, Darren Alwing, he claims that was his great grandfather, Big Jim, that got li <laughs> Little Pete. Now, he is Samya, and they call this the Tong War. But who he was fighting against was the Seiya, the four county. Uh, let me see. This is the Ningyong Association. We don't have a Seiya Association anymore. That broke apart. But Ningyong's for Taishan, the people from Taishan, the biggest group. So it's really the Taishan people against the merchants. The merchants always ran things in San Francisco until the Gary Act. The Gary Act was after the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 when you cannot come if you're a laborer. But they, it was only good for 10 years. So 10 years later, they passed the Gary Act and they made it tougher to, you need now an internal passport. You need identification, you have to carry it with you all the time. The sixth company was controlled by the Samya, the merchants. They were the wealthy people, and they controlled the sixth company. And the sixth company told the US government, in America, only dogs need to be licensed, and only criminals need to be registered. And we Chinese are not dogs, and we're not criminals, so we're not going to comply. 97% of the 105,000 Chinese in America, 97% did not comply with this new rule. It was the largest instance of civil disobedience ever in the United States. 97% of 105,000 ignored it, and they took the government to court, but they lost. So after they lost, the Samya people, the merchants, who was running the sixth company, lost face. And that's when this group took over. They said, most of us are from the villages. We're not merchants, but we got the number. And you folks totally failed us. So it was at that time they took over. And that's when we had the friction between the Samya and Seiya. And that's why Little P came to the fore. He was Samya. And after they killed him, the Seiya people killed him, the Samya refused to buy things from the Seiya stores, and the Seiya people refused to buy things from the Samya store. In fact, if you're Seiya, and you're caught buying things in a Samya store, you will be fined and beaten up. And that was the case. So this was nothing to do with prostitution, gambling, drugs, nothing to do with that. It's just fighting for power of who runs Chinatown. So this was part of it. And what do I have here? Oh, this is the Peace Association. Very few people know about this. So by 1913, because of all the fighting, and by that time, we already have splinters from the mother tongue, the Qigong tongue, and different groups got together and they did do illegal things. The big thing was gambling. That was the most money. And Americans felt this was so bad, immoral, that you have gambling. Prostitution was kind of okay because <laughs> California were mainly a lot of bachelors. And then the other thing was Chinese had temples, all these deities. So, uh, so that was the issue, but they, and some of these uh, splinter from the main tong, they did bad things. The prostitution, the gambling, and the drugs. Actually, hardly any drugs, is the markup on opium was only 20%. You can't get rich marking something up 20%. And it was legal until about uh, 1909, when they made it illegal. But what was, where you can make money was to smuggle in opium 
because the tax on opium was 50 to 100 percent. But the Chinese didn't do the smuggling. They didn't want to get into trouble, so they hired the whites to do the smuggling, and then they would sell the opiums later. But this is the Peace Association wanted to get rid of all this fighting, whether it's between district association or tongs, and they basically did it by the 1920s. They got all the tongs, all the district association, all the clan association, together, and by the about the mid-1920s, it all stopped, because this became the peace organization. They sat everybody down and said, this is really bad for the community. So it still exists, and they still meet, but they really don't have that much fighting anymore. So this is a Qigong Tong. This is a mother Tong. We know it was mentioned in 1854, but it was called the Hongmun the Hongmen, uh, by another name. We don't know that it was called Qigong Tong until about 1870s in Portland, and then in Sacramento, it came to San Francisco a bit later. By 1880, this name was used. Now, this is a very famous place now, the Qigong Tong, here's the inside. It's beautiful, and it's, infamous because of Raymond Shrimp Boy Chow. Anyone here of Raymond Shrimp Boy Chow? Yeah. <laughs> he assassinated the president of the Qigong Tong in 2006. But he was put, captured and put in jail in 2016. So that story ended. But during the time he was in charge, he killed the president or the head of it and he became the head of it. And so he did uh, weapons, running, he imported uh, cigarettes without paying local taxes, uh, money laundering, a lot of other things. It was a short period. Prior to this, this organization never did any of that. They got started to overthrow the Qing Dynasty, the Manchus, which was a foreign uh, group from the north of China. They never comprised more than 5% of the population in China, similar to what the Communist Party is today. But the Manchus ruled China from 1644 to 1911. So this organization was started to kick out the Manchus and return China to Han rule. And they felt for the Chinese in America, and as well as the Chinese in China to modernize, you have to kick out the Manchu and not have an emperor, but have democracy and be a republic to have elections. To this day, that's what they want. They said China should be a republic. Now, they helped Sun Yat-sen, the George Washington of China. They financed him. They mortgaged their house to finance a revolution. This is their addresses of different Qigong Tong offices in America and Canada and Mexico. They had 373 branches. They were more powerful than the Sixth Company. About half the Chinese in America from about 1880 to 1920s were members. This is a Tong. And one of the reasons why the Exclusion Act was passed was that the Chinese always had an emperor. So they said the Chinese will never assimilate, will never understand democracy, <coughs> freedom. And the Chinese loyalty will be always to the emperor like the Catholics will always be loyal to the Pope. And that's why we didn't have any real strong Catholic politician until Kennedy. So this group, with all these branches, every month they would send money to help Sun Yat-sen. And by 1911, after the revolution, China became the third republic in the world. 
it was U.S. first, then France, and China was number three. And the U.S. was the first country to recognize China as a republic. So it's hard to say the Chinese do not like this concept. They understood it, and they wanted China to be that way, but it didn't last too long. Too many warlords. Oh, this is uh, the Qigong Tong, the assassination. This is Alan Leung, and he was murdered, and this was where he was killed. So they take the body past his office, that's very traditional. And this is Raymond Shrimp Boy Chow, if you don't know. But you can, it's good reading, right? Uh, the media always picked this up, but they never mentioned this organization fought for democracy. And we think China is a one-party state, but no, it has eight parties, including the Qigong Tong, is still a recognized party in China with about 1,000 members. Not much power, but their grandfather in, into the Constitution because they free China from the Manchu. Which building is this? I don't even recognize it. Yeah. Oh, this is the King Sing Tong. It's the only Tong that has East Coast and West Coast. And they used to do some of the gambling and some of the prostitution, but mainly gambling. In that weather, it's the 20s and 30s. But the Tongs split up the US, all along, only on Tong, and the East Coast would handle all the East Coast Tong, and the Tongs in the West Coast side will only stay in the West Coast. So they split it up. This is the only Tong that has branches both sides, and I don't know how they got away with it. They're very active in New York still, less so in San Francisco. Oops. This is the inside of that Tong, uh, mainly gambling in the back, uh, Mahjong. But they're famous. This is the watching group, younger watching, in 1974 when they had their reunion. By then they were kind of kicked out of San Francisco's Chinatown. They used the hip sing for their base, but they didn't do it in San Francisco. They joined in New York, and when they came back to San Francisco, they joined the hip sing. And then this is the hup sing tong. You hear all the firework and everything, that's the hup sing tong. And they were, they're still very active. I won't say too much about them here now unless you ask question. Because there's probably some, any Hupsing member here? I want to know the history. They're very active. And this was also Alan Leon, the one that was killed. He was also head of this. He was head of both. Now they fly the... Um, Taiwan flag, the nationalist flag. They're still very national, uh, nationalistic, and they feel China should be a democratic republic and shouldn't be under one party. And same with the Qigong Tong. In fact, the Qigong Tong is very proud of their history. So they donated all their archives to the, bank, uh, to the East Asian Library, the East Asian Library at Berkeley, so a researcher can figure out the history of what they were about. They weren't about uh, all the gang wars and the prostitution, gambling, and all that. So my time is short. This is the Hup Sing Tong. This is the Hup Sing Tong here in Marysville. Uh, they have a real tunnel. You know. Things that Chinatown have tunnel and all this, I've never seen it, but I've seen their tunnel. They have two tunnels underneath. Uh, they sealed it up, but I, I got to see it before they sealed it up. They still have one. And this is the Sui Sing. The Sui Sing, very powerful. They fly the China flag, mainline China flag. They were the first one to raise the mainline China flag in San Francisco in 1979 when China was recognized. 
at that time, the community was still very KMT based. And the reason is the Chinese in America came and worked, most of them worked very hard, laundries, restaurant, laborers, and they thought this country treated them so badly, they will retire in China. So every month, every year, they sent their money back to their families, said, buy some land for me. And that's what they did, buy business, but mainly buy land in the village, so when they go home, they can retire. But when the communists took over, they couldn't go back. And all of a sudden, their family members were landowners, and many of them were killed. That's why the people in San Francisco's Chinatown until recently were very anti-Chinese, because this was their retirement fund. And they lost family members, uh, and it was pretty sad for them here. And they had to stay here as bachelors, and it was very difficult life for them here. So the, but the Sui Sing, they are the pro-China group, very progressive. Uh, they, right now they have uh, a group, several groups, called the Peaceful Reunification of China. In other words, Taiwan, reunification with Taiwan. Uh, we can argue about this for a long time. I think it's going to happen be before 2049, the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party taking over all mainland China. I think that's the target. Uh, Xi Jinping is voted in for life to do that. So this is their reunification of China, uh, peaceful reunification, hopefully. And this is a Sui Xing Tong across the street from here. And uh, this is a big building, 10,000 square feet. We're hopeful of taking over this building and moving this museum over to that side. We're working on that now. It's 10,000 square feet, and we need community people to do activities here. Because it'll be 10,000 square feet. We can fit a lot more people than we have here. This is the inside. We're talking to them about keeping the shrine because uh, it's very historic. Uh, this is a Bing Kong Tong, another Tong. In the 50s, 60s, 70s, they were the main Tong in San Francisco. You can see the Mason sign. They claimed that along with the Qigong Tong. One of the first, they, all the small towns in the West Coast had a Bing Kong Tong until the Sui Sing and the Hub Sing kicked them out. <laughs> so there were some of that. And, uh, well, this is the Big Gung Tong. And Ying Long is on Grand Avenue, very quiet. But you might know the Ying Long Tong, be, uh, and also very pro-China. They, they raised the China flag. You, you might know the Ying Long Tong because you go to the Far East Cafe. If you eat at the Far East Cafe, that is owned by the Ying On Tong, or Ying Du, they have two names, Ying On and Ying Du. And when you first walk into a restaurant, this is what you see. Most restaurants have a Guan Gong or Guan Dai. Most restaurants have it, but this is very different. I don't know if you can see the difference. This is one by the police, the Asian Peace Association, they donated this to a six company. But this one is different. It's a left-handed Guan Gong. You see, he's holding these, his broad sword on his left hand. Most people are right-handed. You will never find a left-handed Guan Gong. He had to make this special to tell you, because only the triads would have this, a left-handed Guan Gong. So it's telling people coming in, if you're in the triads, you come in and see this. He said, we better not mess. This guy's one of us. Could be tougher than we. So that's the signal. It's left-handed. And he had to specially make this, because you can't buy it in the marketplace. So I'll end with that. Uh, I don't know how much time I have quest for questions. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, I was talking to somebody about San Francisco Chinatown and why does it still exist, meaning 
Why hasn't it been develop, developed? Because mm -hmm. it's right next to the financial oh, district, yes. right? So not the real estate. financial district, North Beach. Why has it? Why hasn't China? Yeah, and I was told that it was because the Tongs, the Tongs owned all the property in Chinatown, and that they were going to allow it to be redeveloped. Okay, you're saying the Tongs owns all the property. Yeah, the District Association, Family Association, Tongs, and groups own about 70% of the properties in Chinatown. And why hasn't it developed? Is in 1986, Rose Pack with Chinatown Community Development Center. At that time it was called CRC, Chinatown Resource Center. Got the city of San Francisco to pass a master plan that you cannot go higher than four stories. And if you're going to tear down a building, you must replace the residential uh, housing there. So it's not worthwhile for anyone to develop if you can only go four stories and if you have someone renting, you have to replace the housing at the same price. Developers, there's no reason to go in. So my friends from China and my Chinese American friends know that I'm active in Chinatown, always come to me and say, how can you let the Chinese live like this? The housing is substandard. There's rats, there's cockroaches. We have the highest density next to Manhattan. We have 850, approximately 850 people per acre. San Francisco has 8.2 people per acre. We're 10 times city of San Francisco. We have the highest suicide rate. We have the highest tuberculosis rate in the nation. Highest tu uh, uh, suicide rate in the nation. And they said, how come you can be active in China?